Okay, Scott, this is going to be a quick tutorial on how to add in the topo bases as PDFs as they are downloaded from the USGS and how to do some extra little tips and tricks with them as well as making sure we add in the um, GM19 uh, in a fashion that will allow uh, you to actually see it well. Um, when you add things in by default the first time, they usually come in dark and or um, a little obscured. Um, this process will uh, remedy that for rasters that you add in. So to start off, we're going to go ahead and add in the topo base as a topo map. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and open our folder and we'll navigate to where our um, PDF of the topo base is. And the dialog box then pops up with this information. And if we want to add in, in this case, just the topo base, just the contour lines and the labels and stuff like that, what I typically do is just quickly clear all. Because we don't want a lot of this stuff. We want the majority of it, but it's much easier to just clear everything out and then add in only the things we want. And you'll see why this is uh, actually a little more beneficial later on when we do the orthophoto and the shaded relief map should you want it. Um, okay, so currently we'll want to go ahead and add in the map frame because that will be all of the grids, the geographic names, and all of that stuff. Road, transportation, and you can see in transportation we can add in other things. And this also allows you to turn features off that you don't want to see as well. So I'd say you didn't want the PLSS grid or whatever. You can go ahead and uncheck that box and then make it to where it's not visible. Um, but that right there basically adds everything in that we need. The caveat is we want to turn off the shaded relief as well. Now everything as is will show up effectively just like the topo base looks without the map collar information unless you wanted to add in the map collar information. Um, this is where you can find uh, what vintage the ortho photo is and stuff like that. But I turn most of that stuff off because we're just using the topo base for the contour lines and stuff like that. So if we do this very quickly, this actually works pretty easily. We can alter DPI resolution and stuff like that for speed and things like that if you want to add it in. By default, it's fine. If you wanted, you could import the vector features from a file. I don't think these actually have vector data. I think they're actually still um, raster data. I'm not sure on that, but that'll speed things up a little bit too and uh, keep the resolution high. For all intents and purposes, we can just leave this alone. It really doesn't add that much to it in terms of uh, slowing down your system too much. Um, one of the other things you can do is you can import each PDF layer to a separate global mapper layer over here, and that will then allow you to turn these on and off at will. Um, I learned it this way because they didn't used to have this functionality, so uh, it made it to where I, I know how to do this process really quickly, and then it also makes individual rasters that you can do multiplies to and things like that. So this is how I do it, and this is how I keep it because it allows me some functionality later on. You may want to play with it to see what works better for you. But for adding in the topo to get the contour lines and the geographic names and the stuff that is on the topo map itself, this is the process. And you click OK. It'll take a little bit to chew through all of those layers, figure out which ones it wants, make a raster of it, and then it'll add it in. By default, it's going to add it in up to the top here, and it's going to end up covering everything. And what we're going to want to do is then take that layer and move it down lower so that we can actually just have it be uh, lower in the stack so that we can see our layers through that. So here is that, and we can again go ahead and move this down. And now one of the things that I like to do is come in here and set transparent colors. We can alter it to where, ah, sorry, nope. Let's do it this way. Let's do a multiply with it. This then allows us to see the topo base as we would like it. Now, one of the things we can do is we have this green layer that is the woodlands. We can also remove that as well. 
So there's a couple of tricks that we can do to actually get this to look the way it is. And now what we can see in here is that, ah, that's not the tool I wanted, sorry. Our topo base is showing up as is our lines that we have drawn in and our strike and dip features. Now, there's a couple things that we can do. If this is too intrusive and it's you're having a hard time actually seeing the contacts and faults, what we can do is come to that here in reservoir topo layer and actually decrease its opacity so that our faults, our contacts and faults show up better and we can still see the topo base and usually I set this to about there 60 something like that that allows you to easily see your lines and data and uh, still be able to read the topo base so that's one thing that we can do with that that makes it a, a huge difference in my opinion uh, for working with this okay one thing I do typically do and I forgot to uncheck it is the woodlands so I'm going to do that process again I'm going to close this layer and add the topo back in and uncheck the box for woodlands. This is a personal preference. I'm going to leave that up to you. Um, so by default, it remembers the settings that we had in the previous, um, what we used for the previous adding of a PDF. It remembers those if the layers are the same. So very quickly, I could just come in and check woodland and those will disappear. Remember, if we're doing this from the first time, typically I just go ahead and say uncheck all. I add the map frame itself because I want to see the map frame. We turn off our shaded relief, we turn off our woodland, and then everything else is unchecked by default and it adds in very nicely. Um, this is what has worked for me. This is how uh, I, I tend to function. So again, if this is um, something that you, if you find some other method that works for you, please feel free to go ahead and use that. Um, but for the time being, this is what I have found to be the most beneficial. And, oops, we'll move that down in the stack. We'll multiply and we'll say OK. Oops, and I forgot to set the transparency to be something more reasonable. And now you can see with those woodlands gone, it, it's easier to see the map. It's easier to see your contours and all of that stuff. If that's still too dark for you, remember you can just come and adjust this to be a little bit dark, uh, lighter, more transparent. Um, the same thing works for this slider as well. So if we want, we can turn the opacity back up, but then just lighten overall. I'm going to do a pretty extreme version of that, the topo base. So that does a similar thing, but it doesn't quite... I tend not to like this as much as I do just setting the opacity to be more transparent so you can see through it a little bit. Um, you can go pretty extreme with this and still get good color out of it. Um, but I normally set it about here. This gives you good ability to see your lines and ability to see the topo still. Okay, so now we're going to add that PDF in again because the USGS did a super nice, super handy job of making these PDFs. They did a wonderful job for us in using them. So I'm going to add in that same, and it's going to say, hey, we already have this. Do you want to abort the uh, overlay, adding this overlay in again? And you say no. And then what it does is it comes in with those default settings again. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear all. But this time we're going to go ahead and add in the ortho photo and say OK. Now our ortho photo will come in. And then I'm going to do some playing around with the layers and stuff like that. But once I add the ortho photo in, I'm going to go ahead and add in the shaded relief map. You don't need to with this DEM, but I do want to show you this functionality just so that you can get familiar with it. And let's add in this again. No, I don't want to abort the adding of the overlay. I want to go ahead then and just add in my shaded relief. 
And I personally don't like the US's, USGS's shaded relief maps. That's part of the reason why uh, I add in my own DEM. Um, the other reason is that the DEM then can also provide elevation data for this uh, for the data that you're digitizing as well. So that's a personal preference. I think these are way too coarse. I mean, if you do a comparison, let's turn everything off. If you do a comparison between this 30 meter DEM and the four and a half meter DEM, you can see that this shows so much more detail. It's more crisp, it's more clean. You can actually see the dam that's here, and this is generated from old topo bases too. So the, this shaded relief doesn't actually, um, it's not updated. Whereas this shaded relief was a flown data acquisition layer. So you can see the dam right here is popping up and things like that. Um, so it's the reason why I included the DEM. It, it's just, it, it's better quality data. I did not want to just exclude this because this is the DEM, this is the shaded relief, excuse me, this is the shaded relief that was made in conjunction with this topo base. So I did not want to divorce those things because technically they still are related to one another. Me personally, I tend to like that topo base better, though, or that shaded relief better. Uh, shaded relief, I mean, you could just see the crispness and cleanness of all of the information that comes in. It's just better. You lose a lot of that detail here. The other factor that I really like about adding in the DEM is that with regard to the DEM, I can change the angle and elevation of the sun, thus altering the shading that's occurring too. So if you come up here and come to shader options, oh, sorry, vertical options, I was there, we can adjust this azimuth. So currently it's shining from 345 in this direction. If I go ahead and alter this to be like 45, now it'll be shining from this direction. And we can see the effects of altering that. That allows you, as a mapper, to potentially rotate the sun around and actually see if there is some um, topographic relief that's maybe a little hidden in the topo base that's showing up in that 4.5 meter DEM. Uh, one of the things that, like if you were looking for quaternary faults, if you drop this altitude down really low um, and start rotating your azimuth around of the sun, you can actually start making other features pop up, like these little dots right here. I didn't see those previously. Uh, so those look like two sinkholes potentially, or potentially uh, retention ponds or something like that. Um, but those weren't as visible when this was up at 30. So that's one of the things that you can do with these, is actually start using them to pull out other features. I'm not saying that you will use this, but it's something to keep in mind if you're looking for quaternary faults or something like that. You can uh, play with these bits of information and see potentially if you can pull out other features that may be hidden in the topographic map that show up on the four and a half meter DEM. So that's why I included both the shaded relief map and the DEM. Me personally, I think the DEM is a much better way to go but I don't want to limit what you can use. So that's why I included both. Um, so then one of the other things that I'd like to do as well is I'm going to rename these so that we understand which is which. And this is what I tried to do previously. There's topo. This is the 30 meter thirty meter shaded relief. And this is that NAIP 2011 orthophoto. Um, OK, so one of the other things that I really like about using the DEM is we can actually multiply our orthophoto 
by that DEM and you can start to see that features are popping more and maybe that's a bad area to look at let's see if we can zoom out yeah so right in here you can see what the multiply of the DEM is actually doing so let me turn that back off So you can start to see that uh, shift occur in the ortho photo to further enhance the um, perceived topographic um, um, man. I don't know how to describe that. The perceived topography that is kind of getting washed out in the fact that you have the ortho photo. But once we go ahead and do the multiply some of that begins to stand out a little bit and it further assists you in it, it let me let me put it this way it further assists me in seeing more what the topography is doing in conjunction with being able to look at the um, ortho photo as well it makes uh these stream channels pop more it makes um cliff faces show more and again because we have it as a DEM we can still come in and alter this to adjust how things display so that's one of the things that I like about the DEM is it allows further customizability and allows you to further look at and investigate what you're trying to see one of the other things we can do with that NAIP imagery is just like we did as well, we can go ahead and lighten our opacity on it so that maybe we can see a little bit better the combination of features that we're looking at instead of just you know one or the other. So this is where blending modes really come in to allow us to fully utilize all of the tools that are at our hand. Um, unfortunately, this isn't the same as photogrammetry, but you're getting the idea of what I'm trying to display is that, you know, there's more information that you can get out of using the combination of things than just using the orthophoto or the topo map all by itself. Okay, so now let's go ahead and turn all of these layers back on. Oh, I should show you that trick too. Uh, I did that the slow way. One thing you can do is you can multi-select features. And then if you click the checkbox, it turns the selected features on and off dynamically. So that's another thing to keep in mind versus clicking them all manually. You can go ahead and shift click and turn them off all at once. You can also do a grouping arrangement of these things as well. So I could go ahead and group these into uh, the vector data and then group these into the imagery data as you see fit but I just wanted to show that really quick okay so one of the other things that is now happening is that because our shaded relief is turned on and it is not multiplied we're obscuring everything below that so that's a warning there um, so one of the things that uh, I probably wouldn't use this much, if at all, but I wanted to include it for incorporating full sets of data. So now here we have those images all together and our vector data being displayed all together too. Oops. So that we can see the combination of elements as well. So here's our contact and the topo base and the ortho photo all combined. Okay, so now uh, the other thing I want to do, oh, I need to discuss things here. These are just placeholders. So this star is a radiometric date and because it doesn't have an age as a placeholder, it is just showing 000 as the age. It's just a placeholder so that this feature class actually has 
a uh, feature in it so that it displays properly. Uh, it's the same thing for adding these two, the vertical uh, bedding and the horizontal bedding, and all of these contacts, faults, and folds over here. They're just placeholders for the time being so that when we look at, let's use um, geologic lines as an example, we can see in our line styles all of the fold types. So I believe this is anticline and this is syncline, and this is the accurate and... Um, uh, certain, this is approximate and certain, this is concealed and certain, and this would be the same for the syncline. O1 is uh, certain and location is accurate, certain and location is approximate, certain and location is concealed. So I wanted to add these in so that we could have all of these different things displaying as appropriate, and it's the same for contacts and faults as well. We have those line styles showing up here, and those correspond to the line styles. Oops, that's not the one I wanted. When we are selecting, ah, that was the right one, our line types. So it's, you know, another method of displaying these things. I just wanted to tie those things together and show the difference between the template of creating a feature versus the line styles that are previously incorporated in the map and they correspond to one another. That 010101 code will be coded into the lines you create. Okay, so there is the information on that. You can adjust the transparency and density of all of these things. You can make texture maps out of these things. We can talk about that if you want, um, but that's the gist of what we're trying to discuss with adding in the topo maps. So this is how you will add in those three different files from the same PDF. They're the same file. It's just uh, three different methods of displaying different information with them. And it gives you the ability to further um, adjust oops, further adjust how things display, like the topo base or the topo base and the ortho photo together. Um, and remember with that topo base, so in this area it happens to be coming in a little dark. You can set the pan opacity to be a little um, darker so that you can then start to see these things. As you zoom in, you'll actually see better. You probably won't be mapping at this scale. You'll probably be mapping more. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry. Something like such, or not quite that zoomed in. Something maybe like that. And then the other factor is remember with the NAP, if it is too dark, you can go ahead and adjust the transparency of it as well so that the topo base pops more, vice versa. Okay, so now with regard to GM19, one of the things that occurred is I accidentally geo-referenced it at NAD83, forgetting that, that it was a map that was previously uh, built in NAD27. And then the other thing to consider with that is it was not made in a GIS. It was made in a designer program. It is lacking precision just dramatically. And there's a couple things that I also want to talk about with regard to that. Um, so let's go ahead and add that in now. Um, so I am going to oops, open a file. I will put this in a place where I'll upload this so that you can save it wherever you wish to save it. But um, So there is my NAD27 file. So this has now been geo-referenced in a NAD27 data frame, so this should line up where it is supposed to. But you can see that it comes in dark right off the bat. So one of the things that we need to do with this one is I'm going to pull it down to be in a reasonable location that's usable. What we need to do with this one is also adjust this color intensity. One of the other things that's better to do though is adjust the color contrast and set it to be a linear 
minimum and maximum stretch. This then makes it to where the whites are white and the darks are dark. This, this assists in this. And you can see we made it lighter. It's still not perfect. Um, it's one of the things that's uh, a little frustrating. But if we do a no contrast adjustment, this will actually make the whites white and the other colors a little bit better. Oops. No, it is that one. Why is that not showing up as white then? That should typically make it. <clears throat> That's supposed to actually make that a in, in arc, setting it to linear minimum maximum. The white becomes white and the blacks become black, and it sets a linear stretch to those associated with it. Um, I'm not sure why this isn't doing it. It did the other day when I adjusted it. You can see what how this came in uh, previously. So something else is going on here. Regardless, one of the other things we can do is we can go ahead then and lighten it as well to better adjust. But then you start to wash it out. I don't like that. Okay, I, I don't know what to say about that. Um, this worked better the other day. This actually would be white instead of being the medium gray that it is for whatever reason. But what we can do now with that being actually located in the right location, being NAD 27, is zoom in. And we'll see that the faults aren't perfect compared to um, the GM19, but it is much closer. Now, again, this is a byproduct potentially, I think, of, well, let's also turn off the NAIP. That will assist us some. Um, that's a byproduct of uh, uh, not being georeferenced in a GD, uh, GIS or not being built in a GIS. And then whoever digitized this not doing as good a job of maybe trying to match this. Maybe they were following... Um, This information, the, 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 the ortho photo instead of the GM19 when they were digitizing. Uh, I don't know. I'm not going to make any assumptions on what me, Mike, or you have done to this data. I, I, I don't remember at this point. Um, but the reason why I also want to caution on using this data is if we zoom in, one of the things that occurred in the printing process of this map is we can actually see that their color offset printing did not line up like it's supposed to. This peach line right here is supposed to be perfectly aligned with this black line. This blue line is supposed to be perfectly aligned with the black line here and here. Um, we can also see that this NAD83 line that's actually a analytical line. It's not something that was drawn in um, arbitrarily. It's something that is obtained from the coordinates. Isn't perfectly parallel to the image of GM19. Uh, so that's a word of caution there. Um, this was printed on offset printing, which does a wonderful job most of the time. In this one, you can see that it didn't do as good of a job as it maybe should have. So a lot of the things are blurry because of that. They, they take up more space than they need to, and they aren't perfectly aligned um, like they need to be. And it was actually more obvious, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was this corner. No, not that one. There was one corner when I was looking at this map that was obvious that the offset printing process just did a horrible job of registering to one another like it was supposed to. You can actually see where the four color process just was not lining up. It's this corner. So that's a word of caution with using this GM19. Having not been built in a GIS, these coordinates are supposed to be where they're at, but they are actually suspect. Um, yeah, that's a good example there of how the offset printing process, the green and the yellow, which was blue and yellow, should have been lined up perfectly. So this blue 
should have lined up perfectly with this yellow so that they would have made a green for all of this. And it was probably also supposed to include the red so that it could be black, um, but it should have been black uh, ink. I'm not sure why this is printed this way. Uh, but there are things that are showing up that are showing an error in the offset. This pattern doesn't even line up with the edge of the map at all. So uh, don't just assume that this map is perfect. It is pretty good. But the offset printing process introduces its own errors. And then having built this map in a designer program is going to introduce more errors. There's lots of problems that can occur when we have um, many people touching these maps. Um, it, it is one of the greater fears, and it's why I try and make sure that we're working with um, people that know the pains and pitfalls uh, when working on putting these maps and layouts. Uh, so that's a word of caution and a word of explanation for why things weren't lining up. Um, First and foremost, I georeferenced it in NAD83. That's my fault. Now with it georeferenced in NAD27, they line up better, but they're still not perfect. Um, so that is what I can provide to you for information as to how to add in GM19 and also these three images from the uh, USGS topo base. Um, and how to use them in conjunction with one another. Uh, I hope this was informative. What I will be providing to you will be this right here. Let me zoom to this layer. It will be all of this information right here. This will be the package. Um, you will have to add in those other images yourself. And the reason why is when I package this, it starts to do a combination of all five of those images. So the DEM, the shaded relief map, the orthophoto, and the topo base. It combines them to make the package as small as possible. Adding them in afterwards allows you the ability to work with them like they're supposed to be worked with. But I noticed that when I opened the package, it had uh, done a combination of things based on the aerial extent of some of the images. So that's the reason why when you turn off the topo base, it included part of GM19 was because it combined the topo base and the area of GM19 where they overlapped. Um, that is not okay in my opinion. Um, Global Mapper should have done a better job of making sure that those layers stayed separate. Um, but adding them in the way I just showed you will allow you to work with them independent of one another. And I can provide you with this package that has everything you need to begin digitizing um, the quadrangle. I hope this helps. If you have questions, please feel free to ask. Thanks, Scott.